hang out. Anyway, I wrote this note. Uh, actually, I got it dated 720, so that's the dates on my note. And I, I just started out just by saying, touch your heart and touch your chest. So everybody, if you do, do this, just touch your heart, your chest area, and say, say this with, with, it, with me. Just repeat this. Within my heart, Within within my heart, heart lies all power, lies lies all all power and all ability, and all all ability, ability to hurt, to, to, hurt, hurt, to, condemn, to, to condemn, condemn, or to destroy, or to, destroy, or, or, or to bless, to, bless, bless, to, praise, to praise, praise, or to heal. Or to to heal. heal. Now, <clears throat> I took uh, on each one of those phrases, and I just wrote, to hurt means to cause anguish, or to have pain, or to suffer. That's what hurt means. And actually, the first time that we see the Hebrew word chata, which is translated for the word sin, this is in Genesis chapter 4. That's the first place you see the word. And actually the word means offense. And offense always brings pain. Period. No matter who you are. When you encounter offense, you encounter pain. And many times the pain is psychological. And the psychological pain is the worst kind of pain you can have. Because the psychological pain will lodge when you hear this, it will lodge in your mind. And when I say in your mind, I'm going to put the stick man up on the board man. I'm going to try to give more explanation to the mind because your mind is not your brain. Your brain is an organ just like your heart's an organ, just like your bladder is an organ, just like your intestines are an organ. Those are organs. Now, all of your organs think. So all of them are have access to mind. Okay? But your mind is not your brain. That's the most confusing thing I think that we have in psychology and, and uh, maybe in all, all cultures around the world. We think that the mind is our brain. In other words, we think I'm thinking with my brain. You're not thinking with your brain. Your brain is an organ that's running the machine of your physical body. Your brain's doing a million things or trillion things right now. Your, your brain's growing your hair. Your brain's trying to repair your body. Your brain's telling your body that you got to pee or you're hungry or, or, or your brain. Hunger is not in your stomach, it's in your brain. Your brain is an organ and that organ is doing what it's supposed to do. It's not wrong, okay? However, the brain does pick up on thoughts which are a part of mind and causes the synapse to fire. And so many times we can have a headache from thinking. <laughs> Think too much. Especially you get thinking on the wrong thing too much, you know. Or you get an old song, you know, did it, and you can't get rid of it, and you don't want that thing to go away. So within my heart lies this ability to hurt. That means to cause anguish, pain, or suffering. To condemn, which condemn actually means to punish or to cause somebody guilt, or to express a disapproval, or to declare someone unfit. To destroy means to damage, to ruin, and to defeat. In us is the ability to do all that. And we're very successful at that. We have become professionals at that. Now here's another thing that's within our heart. It's also as equal and have, we have as great an ability to do this. That means to bless. To bless means to praise or to give thanks, to invoke divine favor or to express gratitude. To praise means to, to cheer or to exalt or to honor or to recognize or to worship. And to heal. This is the one I've, wanted, I've been kind of hammering at for the last few days or the last few weeks. And it has to do with the series I got on two months ago, which is out of Genesis 1-3, and let there be light. That was what it said. Let there be light. And what is light? Well, light is all of those things. Light has all of those abilities. Light can hurt, condemn, it can destroy. It is a power that is unlimited in ability. And I want to try to bring some clarity to that. You see, we cannot get where we want to go if we don't recognize where we are. We are in total denial of where we are. 
Everybody, most everybody I know, is in total denial of where we are. So like this person I know, hyper charismatic person I know, they always want to quote a refrigerator verse, but they're stuck. They're stuck in a place, and they can't admit that they're stuck in a place because their mouth wants to constantly spew out a lie. Rather than to you cannot get to where you want to go until you recognize where you are. You have to start where you are. We have to start here where we're at today. A lot of things I taught and a lot of things that were taught to me through charismania, through the hyperfaith message, were wrong. They weren't true. Last Sunday, last Sunday CD, I talked about, or maybe it was uh, Sunday before last, or a month ago, I can't remember, but I talked about a camp meeting that uh, I was privy to, gosh, back in the early 80s when the faith movement was way hyper. And everybody was naming it and claiming it refrigerator verses and writing checks expecting God to put the money in the bank. I was involved in every bit of that kind of stuff, you know. We was, we was just way out, way out on the limb, way out doing stuff like that. But a camp meeting, that at this camp meeting, and this was a camp meeting with Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, those were the two hyper faith preachers that were leading the charismania movement. Atlanta? Yeah, it was in Atlanta, yeah, it was. And here's the people who were there. It was Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Frederick K.C. Price, mm -hmm. and Jerry Savale. And Frederick K.C. Price got up and preached a message, which he wrote a little book on. And the name of that mess, that book, and that little message was Faith, Foolishness, or Presumption. And he blew the whole idea of the hyper-faith movement out of the water, out of that hour. It took him an hour and a half to preach his message in that little bitty book. And at that time, he was excommunicated from the charismatic faith movement. He was Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagelin and all of those people washed their hands of him. But that was the most profound truth that I had ever heard to bring clarity, to bring balance, to bring something that was sound because people get so, so way off out in left field. I, I mean, I did. We all do, or I think we all do, or at least the, the bigger portion of people get so far out. I did, and because it's easy to get hyped up when a whole bunch of other people are hyped up, and you're in there with the hype. And you get out in the real world, and you talking to yourself, there goes your mind. Says, well, I know all of them, they got it there. I mean, you know, they're riding jets, driving new cars, living in big houses. Here I am, I'm just buried getting along. I don't even know if I'm going to make it next week. Can't pay my fire bill. Been there, done that, you know. And when I heard that message, faith, foolishness, or presumption, I tell you, that began to cause me to begin to stir thinking and go back and re-examine a lot of things that I was teaching and a lot of things I was hearing. That was in the early 80s, 82, 83, right along there. And I did. And by 85, I had completely revamped a lot of things because I was taking a Hebrew course from Dr. Roy Blizzard. And you remember Dr. Roy Blizzard, yeah. David Blades. I was taking a Hebrew course from them, and at that time also I met uh, Jimmy Snow, who is Hank Snow's son. Hank Snow, who, who actually started the Grand Old Opera. Well, Jimmy Snow was also a Hebrew enthusiast, and I met him and actually had him at my church in 82 and 83 and 84, three years in a row, and he also was getting me started and hungry for it ancient Hebrew because the more I began to study ancient Hebrew it revamped all of my thinking all of my charismania all of my faith ideas and I realized that the word pistis which got translated for belief and faith should have been translated for knowledge in each place because the key to everything is knowledge the key to power is knowledge because if we are ignorant if we are kept ignorant and don't know we will stay stuck where we're stuck. doesn't matter. You cannot get to where you want to go if you've got the same mind that you had that got you there. I think that everybody's familiar with that. Everybody should acknowledge that. We have to look at where we are and to figure out where I'm at and where I'm, do I want to go, how am I going to get there. Then we can do that. So, to bless, it means to praise, to give thanks, to invoke favor, to praise, means to cheer, to exalt, to honor, to worship, and to heal this is the key. I think this is the main one because I think this is the root of the tree. To heal. And here's my notes. To make healthy, to correct, or to put right. Now, I want you to hear that. To heal means to make healthy, to correct, or to put right. 
And I told you the first place the word sin is found is in Genesis chapter 4. It's as a result of Cain and Abel and their scenario and what's happening with them. If we understood them not as brothers thinking that they're fighting and killing each other, but if we understood them as a mental battle that's going on, and that's what they represent, sin was first introduced there, and it talks about now they are involved in a dimension called time that, that's moving. And that's confusing. Because time moves. Isn't that correct? Time's constantly moving. You know why? Because we're stuck in this thing called linear time. And in time, we have a yesterday, we have a today, and we have a tomorrow. Now, I want to ask you a real important question, and I'm not sure that we could even think clear enough to answer it, but is God in time? Yes, yes and no. See, God is in time only by, by, by volunteering and intuition through avenues that God created. In other words, the spirit soul. I said, oh, wait, God's in time. God's timeless. You can't lock God in time. God don't know yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I said this last week or the week before. In Genesis chapter 1, it throws us a really bad curve when it says, and God said. It says that 10 times in Genesis chapter 1. It's that that they used to build what's called the Kabbalistic tree of life. And the Kabbalistic tree of life actually is a picture of the stick man. Seven endocrine glands or seven days which is facets of life, are seven chakras, and on the crown of it you have three, so that's ten. Seven and three is ten. On three you have the triune aspect of God, light, life, and love, which in Hebrew is actually called Keter, Chokma, and Bina. Those are the three that's we, and so, you know, we all are familiar with that trinity, light, life, and love, but that's timeless. It's not locked in time. It's not bound in time, but it can be in time. And so we are designed in that same fashion. We're designed so that we can be locked in yesterday and constantly projecting ourselves in tomorrow and not recognize today. And that's a terrible thing because we can get stuck right there because we're dragging the baggage, we're dragging the past, we're dragging those things that we wanted to happen or we thought should happen or we wish would happen or whatever, dragging them with us, with us or did happen, <laughs> you know, whatever happened, 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 we're dragging it with us or we're projected out in the future. So to make healthy, that's what it means to heal. To make healthy, to correct or to put right. To put right. In other words, many if not most sickness and or pains are the results of psychological damage done ignorantly. They can tell you right now today in the hospital that 90 something percent of the people that are in the hospital are not in the hospital because indirectly because of a sickness or an illness. They're there because of stress. Because the stress created a sickness or an illness or different things in the body. Happens to all of us. Happens to me. Happens to you. We have, we have all these things happen as a result of stress. Last week I talked about a guy in my church in Indiana who he was running, he was having an excessive stress thing with his son and he was going through a real horrible sickness and the whole right side of his face froze just like he had had a stroke in his mid-30s. And he was like that for approximately three years and had to go to counseling, had to go to all this psychological stuff because that part of his face literally froze. So there are so many different things that happen to us as a result of the things that happen, past tense, and yet we're still carrying them instead of releasing them, creating the stress. And that stress, that stress, unless we put it right, unless we correct it, put it in this right psychological place, yes, it did happen. Okay, now let's deal with it. Let's see what we can do. It, we have to be honest with stuff like that. We try to deny it. It happened. It does. It happened. You know, that's, wasn't that how that guy in Forrest Gump, the, he said, I need a sticker. I need to come up with a sticker. He come up with a sticker. You remember what the sticker was? Shit happens. Shit happens. <laughs> it does. It don't just happen to special people. It happens to all people. There's a reason for that. And it's not right or wrong. So it happens. So many, if not most, sickness and or pains are the result of psychological damage done ignorantly. 
done ignorantly. And by that I mean done through living life. Living life, not really realizing what I'm doing or what's happening to myself, not taking the time to analyze my situation. I'm just busy, I'm just going. You know, it's just uh, living life that happens. And it, it's, when I say ignorantly, I don't mean that, that we're ignorant, disrespectfully, or stupid. I do mean that many times we are ignoring. We are not paying attention. Most of us, that's where we get stuck. We're too busy by the storms in our mind. <laughs> right? Do what happened to you? Storms coming in? Oh, God, I can't pay attention to anything. Done ignorantly by living life. What do you mean, Brother Lynn, by living life? Most of us have some psychological damage done by the people around us. In other words, parents. Not being disrespectful to your parents. Not being disrespectful to my parents. But I'm sad to say my parents didn't really know how to teach and train and raise children. They had a bunch of them, but they didn't know how to do it. I had no clue how to do it. And I, nobody told me. Nobody taught me. So ignorantly, I blindly went through it and done it the way that my parents done it to me, which done it to me the way their parents done it to them, which done it to them the way their parents done it to them, etc., etc., etc. Not meaning that they were bad people. That ain't got nothing to do with it. Again, coming back to the first thing, being honest. It would really be a blessing, I guess, to be in a place or in a home or be people who have had parents that didn't have this dysfunctional issues and could do things correct and right. I haven't met one, but I'm sure there's some out there somewhere. I know there got to be. Most of us, some psychological damage was done by the people around us. In other words, our parents, caregivers, partners. I saw a situation yesterday where two siblings literally beat each other up with words. Why? They got, they got mad. And out of their anger, their words beat each other up. How many times has that happened? How many times has that happened to all of us? And those words are arrows that prick the heart and they go into the heart and they lodge there. And in the heart, your, your, your mind has direct connection to it psychologically. And that does tremendous damage. So people around us, parents, caregivers, partners, siblings, lovers, etc. You just name it. The, this hurt, these hurts are many times deeper than we know and than we recognize. So from that I want to I want to talk about how it's done ignorantly. And I think a part of the reason it's done ignorantly is so we can be just like puppets on a string and be controlled. And what I mean by that is religion has done that to us for, I know, 1,700 years. And religion was not built nor intended to do that, but it became a tool to manipulate us, to control us, and to keep us in bondage for the purpose of owning us. And they've been very successful at that because religion and the government are in bed together and both are trying to do the same thing to us. We aren't free. We say we're free, but we are not free. It's just like I said, if you don't pay the taxes on your house and you think you own your house, guess what? They will come get your house over taxes, over a little thing called taxes. So our freedom is contingent on things that they have, they being the powers that be, have put in front of us to control us. And so I wanted to share with you some things that I see from Scripture, things that I know are true. But let me do this in, in saying that. Let me go ahead and put my stick man up here and I want to show you uh, something that I was I just mentioned and I said. Uh, isn't that pretty? Yeah. He's got a heart. Okay. He's, this is a this is a very colorful stick man, and the reason that I did that is to pay attention to the the colors red and green because green is the color of the heart, 
this sick man is happy. And the reason he's happy is because he has a whole heart. And what a whole heart, actually that's what the word, so, uh, in, in uh, Hebrew, the word for salvation is sonteria. And actually the word means to heal, to be happy, to be prosperous. So when you experience salvation, that's what you're experiencing, is healing, happiness. Salvation is not given to you because you pray a religious prayer or because you ask somebody to come and do something for you. Because if you're not asking yourself and the God that's in yourself to do something for you, it ain't going to get done. And that's a hard statement for most people to hear, but that's just the way that things are. Then we have this sick man. And here's what happens to his heart. His heart doesn't look to be in too great a shape. Do you see what happened to him? He's not whole. He's got what you call a divided heart. Jesus said in Matthew 14, if your heart's divided, don't even think that you can get it. I mean, James, the, the, God, the book of James, the Jesus brother, the book of James says, if you're double-minded, double-minded, divided heart, don't even think that you're going to get what you're asking for. Just don't come out. This is where most everybody's at. Most everybody's at this place of a, of a divided heart and don't know it. Don't know why, because we have been kept ignorant. Now, if I'm going to try to show you mine, I want to show you this picture of mine. You see, when your father released his seed, and it's irrelevant that you know or you don't know your father, that your father was God's big brother or the devil's baby brother, it's irrelevant that your father was either one of those your father released the seed that is half of who you are. And in that seed, there was a thing that was called, uh, it looks like this. A strand of DNA. And in that strand of DNA, one part of that DNA, one side of it, comes from your dad. And the other side of it come from your mom. And so if you look at the color combination of a DNA strand, that's exactly what a DNA strand will look like in a color combination. Okay? That is called, in Genesis 1, I think it's 4 and 5, God divided the day, which is the word for yom, facets of life, from the night the word night is layil in Hebrew, and actually the word night means to fold backwards. That's exactly what the DNA does. The DNA strand folds backwards. So actually, in essence, you have a part of you that is from your father's DNA. And you have another part of you that is from your mother's DNA. And from these two strands, you create an auric field around your body that carries the memory of your father. Why? Because it's imprinted in the womb the moment the conception took place. You had no choice in that. Did you ask anybody if you could come here? No. Did you ask God? No. No. Your mother and father got together and made love or whatever or had sex or whatever happened and your dad released the seed, your mama had an egg, boom, and we all of a sudden got a DNA strand. And that DNA strand is now the print of you, but half of it comes from your mama and half of it comes from your dad. And so now there are a few people who are understanding mind and auric field and realizing one facet of the mind and auric field come from your father, another facet of your mind and your auric field came from your mother, and it's easy for anybody to get stuck in either side of that auric field or mind. And you say, well, I don't even know why do I think that? 
We don't know. You know why we don't know? Ignorant. Why are we ignorant? We are ignorant because we lack knowledge. We have not been taught. It's nobody's fault. I could start throwing stones at the church and, and love to and have done that for too long and could do it for nearly 2,000 years where the supposedly scholars and theologians and teachers and preachers and pastors dropped the ball because they failed. They failed to do the research. They failed to do the study. They got caught in a trap just like I did when I first started pastoring preaching the things that all the preachers preach. Why? Because of popularity, not because it's, it's food, not because it's meat, not because it's sustenance. Preaching it because it's popular. And then when you start to study and dig it, you think, uh-oh, that ain't right. That's not right. And then you go to the, your elders or your friends around you and say, that's not true. That's not the truth. That's not, you can't validate that from Scripture. I mean, you know, when I started to come in against the rapture in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, I started coming against the rapture. Do you realize how many people left my church? Do you realize how many people thought I was crazy? Do you realize right now that I would say probably the biggest portion, or at least over half the church now, has recognized the rapture is a lie. Jesus ain't coming back. I mean, that's just the flat out, that's the truth. It's just, that's just not going to happen. It's a lie. It, you can't even find it in the Scripture. And I knew that, but I preached it. I knew I couldn't find it. And I, I remember just searching and studying. Where can I find rapture? And they said, well, you've got to use the word call up. I said, but the word call up comes from the, he, he, uh, the Greek word uh, harmatenso. And the word harmatenso actually just simply means that you're seized by force. Or an energy. It's like I said, you know, you take you can take five-year-old kids, put them in front of a television, and play whatever the slush bobs or whatever the thing is that they got now, I don't even know. But put them in there in front of the TV, and you can come in there and holler and scream and tell them whatever you want to, and they don't hear a word you're saying. Why? You even say it with your mouth, that's what they call it in the TV program. That's exactly what the word harmatizo means. It didn't mean that anybody was going up in the sky and going anywhere. But the church preached that for 100, 200 years like it was a truth. They preached it from the late 1700s up until the middle 1900s, uh, 1980s, 70s, 80s, and it was beginning to people wake up. That ain't truth. That's a lie. But probably every Christian has heard it to be the truth. How many other things have you and I heard that was called the truth that has got no truth whatsoever in them? Most of the things we've heard is that is in that category. So when you start to begin to see what's happening all around me, where do these thoughts come from? Well, a lot of them are coming from the, the mind, auric field, that your father gave you. A lot of them are coming from the mind, the auric field, that your mother gave you. Your job is to blend them, sift them, and then create your own. Did nobody ever told me that. You mean I don't have to accept all these things coming into my mind? Yes, you don't have to accept them. You can reject them. You can cast them down. You can just, in other words, don't give thought to them and don't give verb, don't give words to them. Just let them go. Think a little bit longer about something. Like Paul said, think on things that's pure, just, lovely, good report, praise, virtue. Think on these things. Huh? <laughs> I got too many bad things going on right now. I got to think on all this bad stuff. I got to If you think on that, you ain't going to get where you want to go. Because you're just going to keep reproducing the same thing. And, you, and we don't want to do that. Nobody really wants to do that. We want to get free. We want to blend this, merge this into the thoughts that the Spirit and the divine essence gives me. So that I can take those, I can take charge. I can be in control of these of these things of, that come against me. Okay. Go with me to Galatians chapter 4 and we're going to uh, look at some things that uh, we haven't maybe looked at before. Galatians chapter 4. And you know, I, I had mentioned this last week, and I kind of gotten away from it for several years, the last several years, that we used to have a sign there, we called it Clear River Teaching Center, we was trying to get away from the idea of church. 
I've, all, I've been trying to get away from the idea of church, but knowing that people, uh, people long to gather and people need to gather, there is energy and strength in gathering, in corporate uh, worship and corporate unity. And so I've thought about that a lot. And the word ekklesio or ekleo actually is the Greek word that's two words that were put together for the one word church. And the word ek or ex means the point of origin. That's what that Greek word ek or ex. The point of origin or the source or the place where things emanate from. And then kleo actually means like the energy or the power of a spoken word or something released. And so the point of origin, if you have anger in your divided heart and you release that out of your mouth, that's what the church really is. It's a place that releases. So it's actually it's what you're saying. And got nothing to do with coming together under a steeple with stained glass windows and call that the church. It ain't got anything at all to do with that, but we've all been taught that. So when you go to the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven churches we have lost the complete idea. That's the, that's the whole problem. We've lost the truth behind most of this marvelous book. And coming back to regain and to capture the truth and to get what belongs to us is the place that we've got to come to. And so you know what that means? we got to go to school. And so a better understanding of a gathering like this is a school. What is a school? A school is a place that you come to learn. It's a, a place that you come to be taught. What? You're taught the principles of living life. So what a church really should be is a place where you come together to be taught the principles of life, to live life. It's not a place you come to get saved. Because there can't nobody save you but you. Nobody can make your heart whole but you. And I realize I'm in a whole lot of trouble right there saying that, especially when the Christians hear it and if they hear it. Because they, they would, you know, they totally would shut me off, cut me completely down right there. But truth be known, you nobody can do anything for you but you. That's the bottom line. That's the truth. It's you and God. And so what we don't like and what we don't want is responsibility. I want somebody to do it for me. <laughs> I want somebody to help me out. Don't just make me responsible. I'm sorry you are. It, it just it don't work any other way. Because if you don't do it for you, in you, and through you, it ain't going to be done. God is not going to wave a magic wand over you. I have seen people, I've gone to tent meetings, I've gone to huge charismatic meetings, I've gone to these, these hyper-faith meetings with all these people with all this power and energy to heal and to do all kinds of things. I've seen people who have had excessive sugar diabetes and they go and they say pray for us lay hands on us to heal us of sugar diabetes now if, if the person who was doing that was on his toes and sharp said uh, how are your eating habits well I don't want to talk about that right now I just want to get healed from diabetes well it's real simple if you'll eat this certain way then it'll automatically take care of itself I don't want to hear that I like the way I eat I need Twinkies every day <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? No, it don't work that way. But you realize we all we look for is some man with the power for the hour. That's all we want. Somebody to tickle me. Give me goosebumps. And then when I leave, I'll take my diabetes with me. Instead of getting free. Why? Because freedom comes from responsibility. Freedom comes when I begin to take control of myself. Freedom comes when I begin to take charge of the rudder of my ship. Hello? It's kind of like we, we leave it on the altar, then pick the altar up and carry that with us. <laughs> so actually, we've got a heavier load than we had when we got there. That's exactly right, Kirby. Wow. All right, here we are. Galatians chapter 4. And verse 1, it says, Now I say that the heir, I say that's me, that's me. That's you me. see, you don't know it, but you are the heir of God. And God is unlimited. God is all-powerful. God is light, life, and love. Those are attributes of God. God is not a man. So therefore, you can actually have God in you because it is the breath you breathe. 
No, it is the life you live. So you are really the heir of God, but you don't know how to draw on your account. And if you don't know how to draw on your account, you can't have somebody else draw on it for you because this is done personally. Every bit of it is done personally. That's why it calls for responsibility. You're the heir. So he says, look what he says clearly. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, that word child is weos. And the words, the same word is translated here for son, S-O-N, whether it's a small s or a capital S. And actually the word weos or son means the pattern or the heir. The pattern of what? The pattern of God, whatever God designed. Here's what God designed. This is God's pattern. The stick man is God's pattern. The seven endocrine glands, the seven chakras, or the seven yawns. Yawns is the Hebrew word for facets of life, or abundant life, or happy life. All of those go with this word yawn. Got translated for the word day. The seven golden candlesticks, seven colors of the rainbow, etc., etc., etc. This is you by pattern, by design. This is you and me by living life in ignorance. We live life in ignorance, and so we become, we, we're like this. <laughs> Woe is me. So what's, what do we got to do? What's, what, I mean, it's, you can look at that and you say, well, I, I can see what I need to do. What do you need? I need to mend my heart. And the heart is uh, it's green. That's the color for the chakra. Green is the color of Green is also the color for water. It's Moses crossed with the children of Israel. The reed, R-E-E-D. And the reed, C, is referring to the plant. Reed, R-E-E-D. It's referring to the green plant that grows in the water. So when Moses is and that's what the translation should have read. It should not read red. It shouldn't say R-E-D. The Hebrew word is not red. The Hebrew word is green. It's the word for green. This is the place it all has to happen. It all has to happen in your heart. Because it's so abundantly clear. Proverbs and even all the four Gospels is so abundantly clear out of the heart proceeds through the mouth the issues of life. You speak from your heart not knowing. If you have a divided heart, if you have a heart of anger, a heart of turmoil, a heart that's been hurt, a heart that's filled with pain, a heart that's filled with anger, guess what your mouth will sound like? The same thing. And you know what it will do to your life? It will corrupt your life. It will, it will destroy your life. My life, it does, it does that. It's, it's not, listen, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. And if we come to the place of blame, well, he, she, they hurt me, they left me, they did this, they did that, then you are disarming yourself. It don't matter what he, she, they did. They did out of their own broken heart, out of their own torn up heart. And I'm sorry, out of their own heart that's broken, it spews hurt. The key is to heal your heart. The key for me is to heal my heart. If I don't heal my heart, I cannot extract what's mine as an heir. That I have the right to. So verse 1, Galatians 4, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, he differs nothing from the servant, though he's the Lord of everything. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, even so we. When we were children, were in bondage. Everybody say bondage. bondage. That's exactly where you live when your heart's divided, when your heart's broken. You live in bondage. You're a slave. That's what that means. That's exactly what that means. What are you a slave for? You're a slave to your pain. You're a slave to your anger. You're a slave. You're a slave. You're a slave. You're, and you fill it in. I mean, you can. the list is innumerable. Mm -hmm. We become slaves. In other words, now we're serving something that we don't need to be serving. Now we are obeying something we do not need to be obeying. <laughs> Aren't we? Don't we? Yep. I do. I do. And what I want, I want to be free from that. I want to be healed from that. So I have to recognize where I'm at. I start where I'm at. 
I can't start where Joe Blow's at. Susie, Susie, and Susie Pie down the road and all that. I have to start where I am. Verse 3, even so we were our children and we were in bondage under what? The elements. Under the elements. Now I'm going to show you the elements. And uh, Can y'all read that word? Electricity. Electricity. Can y'all read that word? No. Magnetism. Okay. Elements. These are laws. Okay? Now. And you know how you notice how I got these electricity? I've got electricity written how? Horizontally, on purpose. And I've got magnetism written vertically, on purpose, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Because why do, why did I do that? Because you see, the cardinal cross and everything in matter is hung on the cardinal cross. Doesn't matter what it is. Now, on the cardinal, everything in matter is hung on the cardinal cross. The rock is hung on the cardinal cross. See, we read the story of Jesus as though he's the only one hung on the cross. Jesus said out of his own mouth, you take up your cross. You're hung on the cross. You see, if we go to the ancient usage of the word cross, we realize the word cross actually is talking about matter or materiality. Because everything is hung on this cardinal cross. And this cardinal cross has two major poles. Two major points. Electricity, which is where light comes from, and magnetism, which is where death comes from. And both of them work. And so when you put the Hebrew glyph, the very first glyph, which actually is the glyph that is for God, and it's number one, that the meaning of that glyph called Ali, here's what the meaning of it is. It's life, Slash death. And everyone says, oh my God, I'm trying to avoid death. I'm sorry. In this dimension, you're put under bondage to that element. And in this dimension, whether you want to exempt from it, you can't. It's a part of it. You have to learn to embrace it. And when you can learn to embrace it, you can live above it and beyond it. doesn't mean that you won't cycle. You see, in electricity... This is what this represents. And it's, it's, uh, it's like this is set in stone. This is airy. Right? I mean, it's just, this is Aries. This is the realm. It ain't going to ever change. This one right here, this one is Pisces. It's the, it's the two fishes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it ain't ever going to change. It just is that way. In other words, this is your head and this is your feet. And your head and your feet ain't ever going to change places. It's just, a, it's an elementary law. You're built that way. So when you are under the elements, this is what this is talking about. When it talks about you are in bondage under the elements. You're in bondage under the, in other words, you moved into this dimension. This dimension is called three-dimensional, right? This is called a three-dimensional world. And you and I came here as eternal beings to live in a temporal body. And you're talking about contrast. That automatically is a contrast. But you came equipped with both the knowledge and ability to live in this dimension of contrast with power and ability, happy and blessed. But what happens? We get caught early. I'm talking about infants. When you're, you know, before you really start talking, when you're still not talking and you're crawling, you're all powerful at that point in time. But you get dumbed down the more you, the more we begin to, when we begin to walk, when we begin to talk, we begin to talk. And really what we talk is what our parents, our mom and daddy, our DNA, Taught us, they taught us to talk. They taught us you can't. 
didn't you? Yeah. Better not. You're in trouble if you do. I said, no, don't do that. But what if you were brought up and all of those negative things were removed? And, and you were told, you can't. Oh, yeah, you have the ability. Oh, yeah, you're all powerful. They wouldn't even be able to control you, tiny four or five year old. <laughs> you would have been powerful, but you weren't. You were brought in bondage under these elements. You were, you and I, this is not right or wrong, folks. This is, we have to learn to live in the dimension we live in. We live in a dimension that's hot and cold, don't we? We live in a dimension, look here, of resurrection. Does not the sun rise every morning? That is an eternal fact. That's a truth. You can go bank on that one. Sun's coming up tomorrow. I guarantee you. But let me tell you something else it's going to do. The sun's going to die. This evening, somewhere between 6 and 9, it's going to die. It's going down. It's going right back down into the grave. That's eternal truth in this dimension. Do you realize that's not true in any other dimension other than the earth? Because light is out there. It's not up and down. It's not on this elemental cross of matter. Now, does it? Does that? See it? See, we're in school, so it's not wrong to say, uh, "Brother Lynn, I, I don't get that, or I need to ask the question." See it? In school, that's what we do, right? And that's what we should do because that's how we learn. I used to try to take my kids and my grandkids and cram stuff in them. I'm going to teach you, bless God. I'm going to teach you, teach you. But I found out that you can't teach anybody anything until finally they want to come before the teacher and be taught. And generally, that means they begin to ask the question. And if they ask the question, then they're ready to receive an answer. They may not like it. They may not agree with it, but they have all of a sudden pulled on something. And when they pulled on that, God released something. And that something is an answer. You, you probably won't like the answer first. The more you think, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, hmm, let me work with that. See, so, so we brought bondage under the elements of the world. Do you see that word, world? That word is... Uh, see, the thing that we get tripped up so often in this book, I love this book, I love the Bible, I love the teachings of it, but I have to go past and beyond the translators. The translations is all messed up. The translation is wrong. It's not right. You see, that, that word world is a different word from the word that Jesus uses over in Matthew 10 when He uses the word world. He uses the, the Greek word aeon at the end of the world. But that word is aeon. This word right here is cosmos. But both times it's translated world. And when you hear the word world, what do you think? You think right here where you're living. You think right here in the elemental part of this. You're hung on the cross of matter in this world, right? And it don't even mean that. It don't mean that in either place when you use the word cosmos or when you use the word aeon. The word aeon actually means periods of time, whether long or short. Or for instance, I could say it like this. The embryo is in its world, which don't last long. It lasts about 60 to 90 days, somewhere right in that period of time. And then, all of a sudden, it moves into another world. And you know what that was called? A fetus. And you know what? It's in that fetus world for another five approximately six months or so, and then all of a sudden, it moves into a whole other world. What is that? It's pushed out of the womb into this dimension. All of those could be used for the Greek word aeon because it means periods of time, whether short or long. Why didn't they translate it that way would help me to understand more about what they're saying. And when they talk about this word world and they use the word cosmos, and I don't understand the cosmos, this is the cosmos right here. This is the, and so what is the cosmos? It's the place where I'm under the elements. And these are major, the two major elements right here are laws. These are also called laws. Laws. 
You read the Bible, the only law that you think about is the law that Moses got on the mountain, and he tells you right here in this fourth chapter that if that's all the law you got, that law is bondage. You're held in bondage under that Sinai law. That's, I mean, that, uh, let me read right here so, he's, so I get it. Verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. He who was of the free woman by the promise. Verse 24. These things are allegory. These are the two covenants. With one from Mount Sinai which genders to bondage. Mount Sinai genders to bondage. Mount Sinai genders to bondage. I didn't say that. He did. What happened on Mount Sinai? You remember? I remember y'all saw that movie. You remember? <laughs> Absolutely. God's up there in his finger. Thou shalt not. Oh, wait a minute. Now let me read that again. This Mount, this Mount Sinai genders to bondage. Thou shalt not. Oh, you mean that's bondage? I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. That's what it says. Bondage. What? Every church that I know of is going to put you under that bondage, aren't they? And they're going to tell you right up front, you better not. If you do, you know what they're going to tell you? You're going to, re you're going to lose your reward in heaven. And they hold that one over you, don't you? Like, you know, they will promise you, you get a crown of glory. You get a big house, bigger house, close to Jesus. If, if, Folks, oh, that is that's works. <laughs> but man, man oh man, we get we get so brought under that that lie. So he says right here in verse three, even so when we were children we were in bondage under the under the elements, under the elements of the world. Under the elements of the world. Okay, I wanna I want to uh, read you a couple of things right here and just kind of close because I have way too many things here. I wrote this, and I want to read this to you. Um, actually, I wrote part of this this morning early, and a part of part of it a month or so ago. So, just uh, to go deep is a personal journey, and that's what we do here. And and th because here in this place, this is a school. This is a place of learning. It's the place that we come. That's why we gather here. It's line upon line, precept upon precept here a little and there a little. It, you know, it's just, it, it, you just keep building, right? Need, mm -hmm. not need. Just keep getting stronger and stronger. And it's this deep crying out to the deep. The deep of God crying out to the deep of myself. So it's actually God crying out to itself. In me. To go deep is a personal journey. We must go deep deeper into ourself. For there we find the answers and we find the problems. Our sense man don't want us to do this. It had rather blame someone, something, some event, and so forth. As long as our sense or senses, I mean, when I say that, the carnal mind that's this. As long as our carnal mind can keep us looking in the past or to the future, it will hold us as a slave to ourself. Our task here, in other words, earth journey here and on the earth, this three-dimensional world of length, breadth, and depth, matter, material, in other words, this... Uh, electricity and magnetism. Our task here is not to just be here and grow up to go through life the best we can. And remember, I think, I know I was taught this, but I guess maybe you were. Remember, we were told to just do the best you can and that's good enough. <laughs> that's what I was told. Just do the best you can. That's all. That's good enough. How many of us have done the best that we thought we could and it wasn't good enough? Probably all of us at different times. The problem is not giving it our best. The problem is we lack the proper instructions on how to do it. 
I mean, that hits me right in the face. You want to tell me to do something, don't tell me how to do it. You're calling me to, to answer to something and I don't know what to do or how to do it. The problem is not just giving it our best. The problem is we lack the proper instructions on how to do it, on what to do, on when to do, on where to do, etc. You know, my grandfather taught me a few little things and I wish I'd have paid a little more attention and learned a lot more things. He taught me that in December you don't plow your ground and plant your seed. That's the wrong time to do it. How many things that we do, that we do it out of the season of the sun and the moon? You know why? We're not taught. Nobody taught us. Nobody taught me that the, that the moon was important in what I'm doing. I remember my grandfather even said, don't dig those post holes when the moon is in a certain sign. I said, Grandpa, I'm digging a hole. What's the moon got to do with me digging a hole on the earth? He said, you don't have enough dirt to go back home. Oh, get real. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Truth. Truth. You know, it's just like I constantly use an analogy of the tide in the ocean. The moon does that. And my God, does it move a mass amount of water. The moon does that. Ain't nothing. Ain't got no power on earth that can do that, move that much water. So the problem is not giving it our best. The problem is we lack the proper instructions on how to do it, what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and so forth. These things we do while living here on earth. See, we're taught in religion that we can't do these things until we get to heaven. It's when you get to heaven when you're going to get well. It's when you get to heaven you're going to get your blessing. It's when you get to heaven you're going to become rich. We're taught that it's then, future. We don't know. We have been taught that we're empowered to be and do now. Our ideas that we gain while growing up in our environment and our culture and our religion, in other words, our ideas about spirit, soul, and body are given to us by religious dogma to keep us from manifesting our true self. Our true self purpose is to manifest our divine human. We are divine human, as we have been told that we are by this very book that's been manipulated, mutilated, added to, taken away, etc. Our true self-purpose is to manifest the divine human as one. The holy matrimony is to join the upper self, spiritual, to the lower self, the natural, as one. That's the union that no man can put asunder. That's the true union Scripture talks about. Don't talk about a man and a woman. There's nowhere in the Bible you can find a ceremony where a man and a woman stands before God and says, I pronounce you man and wife. You're one. It, is, it, ain't, it ain't there. Religion has taught it. Now, I'm not saying that I don't agree that we shouldn't get married or whatever or two people become joined together. Or, you know, uh, but it ain't going to be one. They can enjoy each other and enjoy a union. They should. They should. They should enjoy it to its fullest. Religion has taught us that Adam and Eve lost. In other words, they sinned and they fell from this superhuman status. See, everybody believes that. Religion has taught us that Adam and Eve lost. In other words, they sinned and they fell from this superhuman status. In other words, they lost their divineness. And we are taught that in Genesis 2 and 3 that Eve ate the apple and disobeyed God by listening to the serpent, which was the devil, Lucifer, and at that time put the whole human race in a downhill course to death and corruption. Well, that's the lie that we're taught. That's not true. Eve didn't eat apple, and the snake didn't deceive him. Now I want to read something from Alan Boyd Coon, and I'm going to quit. I'm just going to close Try to shut my mouth here. Okay? Religion has been, the, has been instituted in the first instance as instructions and guidance for man's life on earth. Now, when he says that, he's talking about three, four, five, six thousand years ago when religion was instituted as a pure teaching. 
As a matter of fact, the book of James says pure religion is undefiled. But makes it clear that the religion that we get through this instrument we call church is not. It's messed up. So again, he says religion has been instituted in the first instance as instruction and guidance for man's life on earth. But a false undoctrin undoctrination following the loss of arcane teaching caused the disastrous shift in the focus of vision and the location of value so that what had been intended for our perpetual be hooked in life lived here shot clear over the head of this world and landed in another realm in the astral world of spirits. Did y'all get what he said? I love the way he said that. In other words, the lie they told us is that all this we think up there that we're going to get when we get there, really we're supposed to have it here. Religion has become a cult of other worldliness. A looking to heaven for fulfillment denied here. Hence arose the cultus of spiritualism and indirectly that of ascentism. Only in this life can we understand also the allocation of the idea of heaven as a strategic and central place in nearly all religions. For human yearnings demanded a region in which earthly full failures were crowned with poetic success. Okay, let me read you another paragraph here. Not, not even a Rosetta heaven could be made rationally satisfactory until this matter of perpetual development was adjusted in line with spacious reasoning. But here religion can, religion, I'm sorry, here religion ran into its most egregious era and originated a chain of untold disaster for human life and effort. If proved the ruin of all sound religious philosophy and closed off the channel of all religious benefit. It defeated the prime purpose of religion altogether for it left man bereft of just those incentives which would have inspired him to apply himself with courage, with steadiness, and with fortitude to the task of the accomplishment of which he came to live here on earth. For it postulated the thesis that souls cut off untimely in their growth on earth would continue to evolve eternally into infinite glories of Godhood in spiritual spheres. Here was born a delusion that has stullified the spirit of mankind ever since. For no more can a soul achieve any further cycle of growth out of earthly body then can an acorn become another great oak without being buried in the soil of this earth? And this theory that has pulsed an infinite amount of human effort came by default of religious knowledge of the hidden sense of the term death, etc., etc. Oh, glory. Let me uh, read you. Two passages and I'll close. Did y'all get what Kuhn said there? That's out of Boyd Kuhn, by the way. Uh, one of the most phenomenal writers, I think, that has lived. Let me uh, read you this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods. Wow. Now what is he saying that you're going to have to eat? Not an apple. Knowledge. He said if you get knowledge, guess what? Your eyes is going to get opened. Now is there anything wrong with that? Now we've been told that's what's wrong. Because we don't want the eyes to get open. Because if you get your eyes open, you're going to be able to see what is. They don't want you to open your eyes. They want you to keep your eyes shut. 
And they tried to do that through ignorance. Let me read you another passage, verse 22 of chapter 3. And the Lord God said unto, unto said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. Wow. Is that, is that bad? Let me read you another passage of Scripture. Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man as our image. Well, now, why do you want to make man, humankind, as your image, but keep his eyes closed and then don't let him be like you because you made him like you? Is that not dumb? Hello? That's, that's what we've been told. It says, And God said, Let us make man as our image and after our likeness and let them have what? Dominion. Why? Because they're going to be as God is. They should have dominion. They should have power over the dimension that they're in. Hello? What does that mean? I'm going to have dimension. I'm going to have power over the elements of this world. The laws of this world. Even though I come under them. I've come under them not to serve them. I've come under them to experience them. Yeah, is this verse talking about when God came into us? This is talking about chapter 1 up to chapter 2 verse 4 is talking about the pattern. It's the plan. It's the design. This is the design. The design is to be as God is. That's what the design is. In other words, as God is all-powerful, the design is for you to be all-powerful. But what happens as we come into this dimension, chapter 2 and 3 begins to show us the breakup of this dimension. Or it shows us the reality of this elemental world that we live in. The world of hot and cold. The world of life and death. The world of sickness and disease. It's here. It's not something that the devil brought. It's here. It's constantly trying to confront you and me. It's here constantly trying to destroy our body. You see, there's not a human being that don't have cancer. Cancer cells live in everybody's body. It's when those cancer cells get into a rampage and go to a certain location and in that location begin to grow and there they grow a tumor and that tumor the larger becomes cancerous. Everybody's got it. But when we learn how to live our life free from stress, free from anger, free from all of these things that the divided heart gave me, my body will live healthy the way it's supposed to be. Amen. What does the Bible say about healing? Healing that part. That's exactly. Healing is bringing knowledge to put it back together. Because living through life tears it apart. So now I learn that I'm living in this this sea or this, this place of life, death, resurrection, dissension. I'm living in this place of contrast. Now I learn how to use the contrast for my greater good. That's what schooling is about. That's what coming to school. You, you, when you come to school, we start basic, you know, elementary, uh, and we build on that. You know, I said last week, week before last week, was that I don't remember, that this is a place of initiation. And what is initiation? Well, I've been teaching initiation for 25 years. Initiation doesn't stop. It's one layer on top of another layer. So, you know, when I think when truth is coming forth, truth comes forth at different levels. Nobody hears it at the same level. You hear it at the level you are, but at that level, you're taking another step to a higher dimension. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and that's how truth is. It's layered like that. It can be the same identical truth and you can hear it and it takes you to the next step. So you could actually apply what you just said to that song we listened to or that music. Yes, exactly. I was thinking just as we started to listen to it, I thought, wow, if my mind is so troubled and it's so filled with turmoil, I cannot hear what you said about that meditation. To take all of those things that's troubled me, that's how it's doing. Start, you know, get them, collect them. And then go up there with them on the mountain and, and turn loose. I mean, that, that is a phenomenal meditation. And I did to do that. And I, what I do, I'm releasing all of the anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
anger, stress, those things that's killing me. <laughs> okay, let me go ahead and quit right here. I've, I've got too many notes and too much here wrote to read. So we'll, we'll pick up here again next Sunday. Uh, to be continued. All right. <laughs> yeah.